I started my career uh, in London back in the 90s as a trader for a big American bank called Salomon Brothers. And in the early 2000s, I started my own shop. It was a, a Wake Asset Management. Wake Asset Management, yeah, right. Exactly. And that grew to be a $500 million convertible arbitrage fund um, trading in public markets. I was able to produce a lot of answers to a lot of questions using a lot of data, <laughs> which will sound really nerdy. Um, but, <laughs> we but, all are inside. <laughs> but it was hanging out with really interesting engineers who kind of loved me going off on, oh, and I want this and I'd love this and can we do that and what happens if I press that button and all of this and then being completely engaged in the process of developing something. I'd mention to one guy, I'm an investor. Um, he would stop listening at that point in time and just send me every single deal he had. What was it about Dubai where you said, hey, you know, I need to get there? But a friend of mine was opening a nightclub here. Oh, he'd, he'd moved here, he was a very good friend of mine. And he invited me over for the, um, for the opening, which didn't happen actually. Oh. Um, but I ended up coming anyway, and I stayed for one week, then I stayed for two weeks. And I thought, it's kind of cool here. That's really nice. When I first came here, uh, and I think if everybody that does move here, they, they come with positivity. They want to hope hope they want to get shit done that's why they're here you're going to have uh, you know 30 40 50 investments the majority of them will fail we, we know that you need the one outlier um, that returns the fund and you need several more that make you a 2x 3x 5x fund vc angel investing vc investing founders having successes and now becoming investors you know the marketplace um, for all the good it does um, is a very frustrating place for for a founder and, and founders are they're great engineers, they're great business people, they have loads of great qualities, but they don't know how to raise. The money that you want to raise is not because you need to raise it, it's just because you want to scale and grow. Unfortunately. <laughs> Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of Technology for a Change. I, your host, Hadi Sheikh, would like to welcome another amazing personality um, and would like to introduce Derek Watson. He happens to be the founder of N2 Technologies, a market network, um, an aggregator for startups and investors. He brings about 30 years of experience uh, from the financial markets and we'd love to, you know, hear it from himself. Hey, Derek, how are you doing? Good. Thank you so much for the invite and being here today. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you so much for taking out the time. Pleasure. Uh, the audience would love to know, uh, you know, a, a lot about why or how. What's your story? How did you end up here? How do we get here? 30 years. Makes me sound incredibly old, eh? Wow. Um, no, I heard you love climbing out of mountains and plains. Yeah, I still try and do that when, when it's possible. Ah, young at heart. Young at heart, indeed, trying to keep that way. Um, no, I, I started my career uh, in London back in the 90s as a trader for a big American bank called Salomon Brothers. Okay. Um, trading proprietary capital, trading the Japanese products, so options, equity, convertible bonds. Um, which fortuitously, fortuitously took me around the world. I worked out of uh, Tokyo, worked out of Zurich, worked out of Frankfurt, and then back to L London. Um, and in the late 90s, a lot changed in, in the city um, from a risk perspective. Okay. And all, all the risk traders were kind of shown the door and we all moved out. And that took me to uh, Geneva in Switzerland, where I took, uh, I, I started my first hedge fund, and that was under the sponsorship of a South African company. Right. And then in the early 2000s, I started my own shop. It was a uh, Wake Asset Management. Wake Asset Management, yeah, right. Exactly. And that grew to be a $500 million convertible arbitrage fund, um, trading in public markets. But it was really over that period that I got very involved in technology and how to use technology uh, and the benefits of using it um, for collecting data, to run algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. And where my sort of uh, investing in startups really began. Amazing. I mean, so I believe the success actually led to Wake 2.0? Yeah, indeed. So, well, over that period of time, um, you know, like a, it, it was a hedge fund, but essentially also a, a startup. Um, and we had to find our unique proposition to raise capital from LPs to invest into the markets. Super competitive. 
um, environment. Finance is generally competitive, so being in a hedge fund environment was also super competitive. Um, and there's a lot to deal with. So we, you know, we, we built a lot of tech um, around uh, data collection, and this is pre-cloud. So this was you know, a big room, loads of servers whirring away, getting that data in, cleaning that data, understanding how that works. Um, then running risk management systems, uh, valuation systems, and then, you know, just because humans are lazy, and I'll put my hand up to that, um, you know, writing algorithms that would do our trading automatically yeah, right. and basically allow us to have time to do more interesting things. I mean, to do with work, but finding different opportunities. Um, and after the crash, I sold that business to my partner. And I kept the private side of the business, so all the private investments, et cetera. Right. And that's what led to Wait 2.0. I see. So, I mean, when was that tipping point where you said, hey, you know, I want to be able to do something on my own now? Was it, you know, making too much money for <laughs> the companies you worked for? I mean, what was that? Um, I think it was an interest thing. More, I see. more than really nothing to do with, with, with money. It was a uh, purpose more than anything else. Uh, you know, after 08, 09, there was a big change. I think that was a life change, uh -huh. um, a change in my grey matter for sure. I grew up through, um, you know, in the UK, through the 80s, Margaret Thatcher, capitalism, eat all you can. Um, <laughs> so from that market, like your interest in tech, you said you always had an interest in tech, but yeah. I mean, what kind of tech? You said pre-cloud. Um, I mean, it must have been like, you know, you're talking about the servers, legacy systems. I mean, we had probably, you know, some big giants back then too, but pre-cloud. But what was it in tech that really inspired you? Um, convenience. Really, really seeing how it made my life so much easier. Um, you know, there's, there's two things. Obviously, being in finance, um, it's a lot about numbers. Um, but the way I traded, what our trading philosophy was, it was a lot about probability and statistics. Um, so that's really what attracted me. I was able to produce a lot of answers to a lot of questions using a lot of data um, and, and find the outlayers that I could invest in. Mm. And that was really what, what drove me to that. Um, and I think the other side of it was, um, <laughs> which will sound really nerdy. Um, but <laughs> We but all are inside. <laughs> But it was hanging out with really interesting engineers who kind of loved me going off on, oh, and I want this, and I'd love this, and can we do that, and what happens if I press that button, and all of this, and then being completely engaged in the process of developing something that was actually solving a problem that I was living every day. And the interaction of the boat both kind of led me into, I want to find more of these guys solving, or girls, so solving more of these problems. And that's where I started investing, through the fund vehicles and personally as well. All right. And um, after Wake 2.0, like N2, which is, you know, a recent yeah. founded uh, company, I'd love to hear a little bit more about How that goes. That. Well, that was kind of, um, N2 is kind of, um, how do I say it, kind of the culmination of frustration, if you like. Um, so, you know, through, the, through those hedge fund years, I was sitting there as an investor, um, receiving deal flow and, and too much of it, essentially. My inbox would be pinging. I'd mention to one guy, I'm an investor. Um, he would stop listening at that point in time and just send me every single deal he had. And I was, if you'd listened to the rest, I would, would have explained what my thesis is. Please, go ahead. <laughs> no, at that, at that point in time. You know, <laughs> marketplaces, software marketplaces in Europe, essentially, is where I was looking. Mm -hmm. um, but I received deal flow for, you know, a farm in Uruguay, um, a boat in the Bahamas for sale. And I was going, you know, why are you sending me this? Um, and then I had wait to... I'm interested in tech, like... <laughs> exactly. You should know that. Well, yeah, but they don't want to listen because there's a fee attached. So they think, well, you know, the minute you say I'm an investor, um, they think, well, I'll send him everything because maybe... I'll get a fee out of this somehow. So that was one level of sort of frustration. The next level was when I started helping um, founders raise capital. And I realized that was the wake to o period. Um, I was trading in a whole bunch of esoteric assets, but also started helping founders as a mentor on a board of a few companies. Um, and, and, and that was really, really difficult going out, finding what, what founders are told to do and what they have to do and what they are currently trying to do, find relevant investors. 
um, they actually have cash to invest in new opportunities. Um, and that was an incredibly polluted um, marketplace and incredibly difficult. And I know, you know, as a founder, and especially if I've, I've invested in them, I want them to produce and build what they said they were going to do and not take a second job, which is, you know, a full-time job of fundraising. And a huge part of that is the discovery process. The go-to market is one part, but the Absolutely. discovery of investors that are relevant um, was the next part. Um, <clears throat> and that, that's essentially what brought me to Build N2, which is to make that first engagement relevant. Because we know a professional investor has a thesis. Yeah. He has to have a thesis because he went out and raised money from LPs that said, I invest in MENA. I invest in Africa, London, wherever. Yeah, I mean, it has had previous successes and failures. Precisely. And uh, identified their niche. Yeah, that, well, that's exactly it. That's where his expertise lays, right? Yeah. So he, kno he she knows these things, um, and that's what it's based on. Now, if we can, if we can find a fa founder and match him to those criteria, once they're introduced, the relevance of that conversation is at a much higher level. And you take away, you know, a, a certain part of the market that I don't like, and that's really the asymmetry that that, that lays between investors, uh, and why we kind of have these opposing forces. Um, we touched on earlier these opposing magnets, you know, where they both need each other, but they're, they're the laddered marriage that you were talking about. Yeah, exa exactly. That Latino marriage. They both love each other and both want each other and need each other, but for some reason keep on arguing and pushing each other away. And that seems a great part of the market. So what N2 tries to do by aligning both sides is to give it relevance. Right. So you know that that conversation is going to start um, because you want to be in the same room talking about something that you're both interested in. I want to invest in fintech. Okay, well, I'm not going to bring you an edtech startup then. Of course. Right? Which just annoys you. And you're they're interested in. So, I mean... It is time. Time is money. You're saving them a lot of time. Exactly. Even the f uh, founders and the investors. That's what N2 is doing. Yeah. And I believe uh, on your platform you've gone from 500 investors from last year to now, I believe it's close to about 800? Yeah, we're coming up for 800 qualified vetted investors on there. Vetted investors. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, uh, and then how did you get to Dubai? Oh, UAE. how did I? Um, so Obviously, you've explored, you know, most of Europe. Uh, what was it about Dubai where you said, hey, you know, I need to get there? Um, I, was, I was living in Geneva in Switzerland. And uh, it was after the crisis. Kids had flown the nest. And uh, I was looking for something else to do. Um, I looked at moving to Miami. I looked at Barcelona. And then, uh, actually, a bit of a side story. Um, but a friend of mine was opening a nightclub here. Oh, he'd, he'd moved here. He was a very good friend of mine. And he invited me over for the, um, for the opening, which didn't happen, actually. Oh. Um, but I ended up coming anyway. And I stayed for one week, then I stayed for two weeks. And I thought, it's kind of cool here. Uh, it's really nice. Um, going for a run every morning, and being healthy and enjoying life. And I, I think I stayed the first time I stayed for three weeks, then I flew back. Um, I think that's what it is, quality of life. Quality of life. Safety, is, yeah. right. And then would you say ease of doing business? Um, I mean, that's <clears throat> most of where you get your startups from, I believe, right? Yeah, Are to, they like to a large degree. What I was doing at the time, it didn't really matter where I was. I was kind of a nomad anyway. I, I had a bunch of people working for me in an office in Geneva. Um, and after about three or six months, I made a very firm decision. Um, I was traveling in between Dubai and Geneva, and I made a decision just cut everything, and I wanted to move. Fresh start. Um, Amazing. How was that different from, I mean, when you were entering or penetrating the market, m let's say MENA or GCC, how was it different from what you had experienced? Um, after 08, 09, uh, the climate in Europe really changed um, to the point where I've always lived in a world of um, optimism and getting shit done. And not a world of, well, I've got to ask my boss, or I've got to check this, or I've got to do that. And it's always, it, it's normally a no, sometimes a maybe, but very definitely never a yes. 
And I think after after 0809, the whole mindset of literally everybody changed. Um, and it was just a horrible negative environment. You know, I went back to London for a while. I was looking, maybe I can do something here. But even there, it's a little bit like that as well. And when I first came here, uh, and I think if everybody that does move here, they, they come with positivity. They want to hope. Hope. They want to get shit done. That's why they're here. Yeah. Uh, and I love that energy. When I first arrived, I just felt that energy again. Uh, and it was great. And ev- you know, everything is possible here. Everything uh, is, yeah. Yeah, there are barriers as as with everywhere, but That's I do feel it's much. Yeah. I feel it's much easier here. Yes, oh, I agree. So it was essentially the ecosystem that we noticed. I, I believe it was four years ago, three years in a row. I mean, Jitex was yeah. one way we actually found out. Hey, so this is where technology is thriving, and of course, you know the visions that these guys have, everything you know, just bringing up to that level. Uh, it's at that magnitude is great. And the ecosystem itself, um, we've had a few successful uh, exits, yeah. uh, some great acquisitions in the past. Um, and since you know, I'm dealing with a lot of founders, particularly focusing on product strategy and your go-to-market, financing, right? uh, raising funds is a huge part of it where they're, again, I feel like they need to be educated in terms of how to approach them and when the right when is the right time but i mean it's always been about innovation within the region and is there any particular thing that the investors are actually going on if you look at the percentages are they actually investing in technology or are they investing in the eventual result or the roi as a vc you have to uh, invest in the end result right you know i mean it's just the way vc is it's power law Mm-hmm. You're going to have, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 investments. The majority of them will fail. We, we know that. You need the one outlier um, that returns the fund, and you need several more that make mm-hmm. you a 2x, 3x, 5x fund right. um, to attract more money. Of course. So and they're not really focusing on, like, hey, AI or big data? Or oh, no, for sure. Yeah, for sure. There's, there's a great section to that. But, you know, we have to be incredibly careful um, about looking at... Um, I'm going to be careful what I say here yeah? <laughs> about um, <coughs> how we how we look at VCs as well because there will be and uh, you know we've just gone through through that you know the old saying that you know we'll, w- when the sea goes out we'll see who wasn't wearing swimming trunks I think that's coming very true <laughs> um, there was a lot of investing going on based on FOMO and trend following an awful lot of that and there's an awful lot of people or a, a lot of investors that are the true old school ten year view this is how the future looks. And this is the technology that will be part of that transformation. VC, angel investing, VC investing, founders having successes and now becoming investors, has, has that market's exploded. It's absolutely enormous. But I think, you know, and I've, I lived this in the hedge fund world as well, that explosion at the beginning of the 2000s of hedge funds and coming from all sorts of different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. And when we went through a couple of uh, big moments through the 2000s, before 0809 in different areas. Uh, and you saw a lot of people got carried out because they weren't experienced in what they were doing. Right. They were just riding the tide. Uh, and the tide riding was con- the tide, absolutely. Yeah, it was constantly going up. And we've seen that again. We've seen the cheap money come into the market. We've seen huge valuations. We've seen a lot of paper profits, okay. which have paid a lot of founders, paid a lot of, uh, a lot of managers as well along mm-hmm. that journey. Um, and then you see, you know, the end of it, what happens when people like SoftBank announce, um, you know, they're, they're at the end of this, right? They're, they're the later stage guys. And you see what happens and you see what happens with IPOs that have come out and where they're trading today, you know, trading at 50 multiples all the way down to trading at five multiples. So yeah, the, the tide's gone out and it's changed an awful lot. Um, and I think that that's going to change the way that old investors uh, and new investors look at the market going forward and who they're going to invest in. It's interesting you've mentioned old school investors versus, you know, the new age investors. How much, I mean, does it rely on mobile applications? Is that enticing? Do you think, because I'm a huge evangelist of uh, Agile, right? MVP, Mm. where you start from the scratch, actually validate your idea and then build upon 
you know, user behavior and feedback and then constantly iterate. Yep. But how important is, you know, having a mobile application to these new age investors that click, light up a bulb, say, OK, so mobile application means more user retention, more. Is it the numbers now or is it the customer lifetime value? Like what exactly gets them going? Yeah, I mean, when we're looking at technology, so we'll just look at apps and yeah. and or web um, applications or, or apps. Um and I agree 100%. I always preach this. In fact, I've changed MVP to MLP, minimum yeah. love product, because yes. of the period we're going through right now, which is, you know, we have the old valley. We touched on this earlier. We have the old valley um, way of doing things, and that is just bring me users, bring me users, bring me users. PayPal, you know, how did they get so many users? They paid everyone 20 bucks. Right. I mean, easy, right? And, and eventually everybody knows what you're doing and eventually they all start using it. It's fantastic if you're paying them. Um, but that model, in, that, that model currently is, is not going to work. Okay. Um, we, we've covered the basis on most of the apps and, and what they can do. There's just going to be some iterations, some things getting better, some things changing. But I don't see, um, we saw with Clubhouse, for example, I don't see the, the, the next social app coming along. Right. And going, well, we've got 10 million users. We don't know how to monetize, but we've got loads of users. I don't think that's investable anymore. Okay. Uh, and I think Clubhouse is a great example, even with the likes of Gary Chen from um, Anderson Horowitz behind it, um, the man who defined you have to be defensible and have a moat, um, back the biggest company that had zero moat. And within, you know, within a couple of weeks, everybody else, Twitter were doing it, and Skype even had something where you could do these online... Um, radio broadcasts. Um, so, so I, yeah, the app side of things is incredibly important. I think what, what, what you said about the MVP, MLP, I think that's it. And I think you know, the whole sort of landscape and picture that, I, that I've seen is like when we were building in between 2000, 2014, 15, um, you need a lot of coders, a lot of engineers right. in, in, in the room building that stuff it was incredibly difficult um actually getting to the next stage building an iteration getting tech it was all a discovery process trying to can can we actually do that we didn't know um whereas now we're we're over the other side we can practice you can't think of something right now that we can't do i mean it's real you know star wars stuff right the stuff that we think of that we can't build with tech is, is science fiction. Um, so I think startups have changed. And, and the way they've changed is they've got to become businesses again. We can't just be talking about engineers anymore. Right. It's not engineers. You've got to be businessmen because we can build all the stuff now. We've got it. We've got it. Right. We've it's got there. it. Right. So now it's about going back to some sort of old fashioned business. And that's why I, I love the sort of MVP, MLP iteration. Get out there, build customers, build community. And this is very obviously you know, community specific. There's many other businesses that don't need a community, B2Bs in a different way. Um, but really for customer centric product, mm. you've just got to get out and then build that community. Absolutely. That's what it's all about. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, a lot of these people with ideas, I mean, they've got their pitch decks, but they don't have the product. Like a lot of people, like, I mean, if someone would come up to you and say, hey, I've got this great idea and I'm looking for an investor, but at the end of the day, it's not, you know, the financial plan or the uh, the pitch deck or whatsoever or the idea itself, no matter how innovative it is. Mm. You have to have some sort of MLP, MVP out there uh, functioning. I, I mean, believe so. Right. Yeah. And a lot of the founders kind of, you know, that we talk to sometimes, although they're in that stage, that early stage where they're bootstrapping it and um, bringing it out there, they still feel like, hey, we need an investor. But what are they going to invest in? With thin air? So that's where, you know, I try to really tell them, hey, so there are ways that you could validate the idea, go to market and identify and see, you know, or project mm-hmm. at least, you know, the next three to four years. Obviously, there's competitive analysis involved. I mean, there's a priority matrix that we often talk about. And, and that, I, I think, in terms of the roadmap that, you know, the investors look for is where they could actually or what could they add to the roadmap, yeah, what um, versions. I mean, one of the things that we we've worked on in house quite a lot 
um, for investors and things that we want to release and we're speaking about is that because we are past the sort of obstacles of building tech now, mm-hmm. you know, there's people like yourselves that can put great product together um, at, a, at, a, at a cost that's affordable. Um, it becomes now a, a, a about the, the founders, even more than it was before. The founders had to prove themselves previously that they were great engineers. And I think the investors yeah. would tell them, this is how you go to market and we can support that journey. Right. Now it's turned around. And, you know, some of our discoveries um, have been that the most successful companies, um, not at the sort of VC 100x level, but sustainable companies that go out, build a business, um, make some money. Remember that? Um, Make some money money. along the journey uh, and and build, you know, a good old fashioned business that's solid um, using technology, of course, um, but not being a, a, a blowout, a unicorn or whatever you want to call them. Um, um, just building a, a, a great business, the leader of that business seems to, in, in my experience, and I've looked at this pretty deeply, he's a vertical expert. He's a domain expert. And that, for me, is what the game changer is. Okay. Between 10 years ago, having to be an engineer, I think today is the day of domain experts. They probably work for someone right now. With what's going on in the market, they probably don't have the whatever the word is guts okay um to to jump ship but what you can do today is use someone a venture builder to go and build the mvp for you to go and verify that business for you for very little and you can sit in your job and do the two once you validate it you leave your job and you start that business and i think that is the model of today that can work i see because we That's need great advice for everyone out there. Yeah, I mean, I just you know, I just see you know, engineers trying to guess what people need um, is not where it's at. So, um, I mean, you know, we could actually get back to the basics a little bit. A venture building, as you mentioned, like how would someone be able to benefit from that? What exactly it is that they do? Some people are not aware of that, and that's what what venture builders do. Yeah, I mean, you've got it at different levels. Um, I speak to Are we some. talking like pre-stage, <coughs> concept stage, idea stage? Like, I think I think that's literally what it is. It's ideation. I, I've identified, I work at XYZ Corporate. I've identified a problem. I need to speak with someone. Okay. I need to speak with someone to understand what those next steps are. I know with an abacus and a calculator, I can get this job done. But it's really inefficient. I know someone out there can build this. I know there are certain systems that we could fine tune or it's it's a bit like Stripe but it's not it's a bit like Uber but it's not we can but I've identified a problem that can you know um, look like this but for this industry maybe it's as simple as that and that's where you know venture builders can step in but I think there's extra parts to layer onto venture building now okay and that is the ability to not only provide that MVP and that tech but also to provide that community and the outreach to that community. I think a huge part that's missing is the communication angle. Right. Like everyone that I see that's out there uh, um, building successful product for a B2C, sometimes even for B2B, but B2C especially, they have community. They are messaging continuously. They are writing really good stuff so that the community can learn how this is game-changing how this can be used, uh, and all the benefits, user benefits to it. And I think that's where venture builders can really make a difference now, by adding those three components, Mm -hmm. being the engineers, being the marketers that are out there, but having that founder, who's the domain expert, sitting there, kind of, as a CEO should, guiding the ship. Right. With with people putting all that stuff together for them. And I think that's really where venture building sits. And I think even more... (laughs) <laughs> Sorry to go on. No, no, I, I, <laughs> I'm off. On, I'm off on one. Um, but even more, I really see that in um, in climate as well. Mm-hmm. I think that's a fantastic area um, where we obviously, I mean, from my standpoint anyway, is obviously something we need to deal with. Um, if you notice, July was forty degrees here. Yeah. Uh, it should be fifty. That's you know there is something going on with the climate. We can't deny it. It's pretty obvious. And I think climate tech. Um, and building that out is really where the messaging 
needs to be coming. I see. Because there's a lot of people out there building climate tech, but there's no marketing. There's, it's, it's just a polarized market at the moment. And I, need, I, I think that's where yeah, big gonna, changes can happen. I was going to come to that, like at this stage, what are those, um, you know, we have the fintechs, we have, I mean, they, we saw a huge rise. I believe we have more than 350 plus fintech startups registered here in the UAE. Uh, what else is basically out there? Climate tech, you mentioned, is one. Yeah, cli- climate tech is huge, um, but it's a little bit slow to take off um, in, in many ways because it seems like all the investors have to be real believers. And there's this middle ground um, in, in venture. Um, I don't know how to put it. But there's some greenwashing going on. And it's kind of like a lot of venture funds going, yeah, but I invested in XYZ and they now employ 20,000 people. It's like, but you didn't set out. It's a, that, that's a consequence. You didn't invest in them because they were going to... I mean, that's just good luck, isn't it? I mean, well done for investing. But what about the other 90 companies that employ zero because they all closed out? So, you know, we, we, we've got to stop that somewhere. And I think the expertise needs to come from venture capitalists as well who understand... Um, you know, what a, what differences um, a young company can make by doing things properly today. Even if that is a venture capitalist going in to um, um, an e-commerce platform and saying, can you re- use, don't use that plastic, for example. Um, use this recyclable material to right. package. Just do it differently, do it better. And the reason, and, and it's super important as well, and it's not just because I want to save the planet, because we all should. <laughs> <laughs> but there's another point to this as well. And that is, it's going to be incredibly difficult to sort out this mess in five years' time. When you're, out of hand. Yeah. And when you've grown as a business, right? When you've grown as a business, and now I was delivering one package a week, and now I'm delivering a million packages a week, and I've got to change that whole supply chain. I've got to sort all this shit out that I didn't listen or didn't implement at the beginning um, because now, and you can see this happening in Europe already, I'm going to get taxed so heavily for my carbon output. Right. I'm going to get, I won't have a business. And I put out, I put out this thing, you know, be get ESG ready, future proof now or be future beep. And, and that's exactly what's going to happen. So, and I think that's the responsibility of um, venture capitalists to their LPs as well is to take a responsible um, line now. Think of a more sustainable approach. Yeah. Without being an impact. You don't have to be an impact fund, is what I'm saying. You don't have to just be, I'm only investing in climate tech. But all of your investments as a generalist or someone that only invests in fintech, you should just be making sure that those startups are doing the right thing today as well. Um, And it's to protect your LPs and your earnings going forward. No, that's a great point. I mean, something definitely, you know, all these businesses should consider, and especially while they're thinking of scaling. I mean, if they were making about 100 orders per week and they go up to about 5,000, they have to consider how they're going to make that shift, which is great. Um, I want to talk about a little bit more about fundraising. You know, a lot of these founders are just simply, um, you know, they're just out there going, knocking doors, uh, calling, making videos, you know, uh, people just sometimes adding up reels on Instagram, TikTok. Seems about to be working, right? It, it does work for them, but I mean, I feel like sometimes trying to find out, as you mentioned, the marriage, it's how does a founder identify? Or, I mean, I know that the VCs have their own vetting process, but hmm. founders, how could they do due diligence on their part on the investors that they want to work with? Yeah. Um, that, that, what that's would you it. recommend, <laughs> suggest? <laughs> Give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's what I'd rec- recommend first time. But obviously, I can't pick up the phone to everyone. Um, but yeah, the, the, you know, the marketplace, um, for all the good it does, um, is a very frustrating place for, for a founder. Um, it's a very strange place because all the rule books and all the advice are written by just one side of the market. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, all the investors write, this is how you should approach us. Uh, and for me, it's the you know a marketplace that is completely upside down, um, and it's just ruled by the people that have the you know hold the purse strings. They they rule and dictate what should happen. Um, the founders. 
No, the the, the investors. Okay. They dictate the, the rules, right? right? Completely. So it's kind of, you know, check out what, go to our website, check out what we do, qualify us to your startup, and and then apply to us. And if you if you make a mistake, we'll get really frustrated. And we receive so many that we can only spend 30 seconds looking at it. And we'll just ghost you. And all of these horrible stories that you hear, which, you know, they are evident. And I sympathize massively with VCs as well. Um, because I, I know what it's like to... to Receive tons and tons of applications. Of complete shit. That have got nothing to do with your experience, nothing to do with your thesis. But everyone thinks, oh, it says VC after their company name. Send it, send it, send it. Or, you know, and, and founders are they're great engineers, they're great business people, they have loads of great qualities, but they don't know how to raise. It's, it's not something you're ever educated in. That's not something, you, you know, you do an MBA in fundraising. Um, it doesn't exist, you know. So you're just taking one side of the story to get educated by a whole bunch of rules that are written by one side of the market to suit them. That's it, not to suit. And, uh, and that's the bit that always confuses me and the bit, you know, I will speak about and, and speak to VCs about. But why is it that you think um, a founder should sit there and qualify a thousand VCs and then try and reach out to them or go to an event to try and meet them or this warm handshake nonsense, you know? Instead you, of actually focusing on the business. That's what sure they, they should be doing, right? Yeah. That's what, so there has to be a solution in the middle that works, that's way better. And that's what we're trying to build. And we're trying to build this you know, in a, in a way that it's not just um, VC fit. It's also founder fit. Because the yes. two of these things have to match. Not just one side. It's not just like, oh, you're a fintech investor and I'm a fin. There's way more to it than that. But if we could just do it, instead of doing this catch-all system that VCs tend to do, I want to see everything that's fintech. If we could just calm it down a little bit and make more sense and use more more quality control within it, in it rather than quantity, right. then we'll get to a point where everybody can just be a bit calmer and spend a bit longer, um, and maybe you know trying to understand who the investor is in a better way rather than having to read about it all you know every single point that they've written, what they've done previously, and for founders the same you know maybe the, the, there's more about the actual founder and what I like as a person. Because it, at the end of the day, you know, if we if we look at some of the um, some of the trends that have gone through, there's like you know the sort of online trading app, you know, there's a thousand online trading apps. What makes the difference to me as an investor about who I'm going to? Well, I mean, they're, they're pretty much just replicating Robin Hood as far as I can see. Okay. There's not a lot of difference, is there? The market size is the market size. The the cost of your back end and whoever you use to settle your transactions is the cost of that. Um, how many users can you get? What are you doing? But all that boils down to, well, the differential is what marketplace you're present in, size of market, uh, and who you are as a founder and what that messaging is going to be. Exactly. Do I trust you can get more customers than him or her doing the exact same thing as you? That's all it boils down to because you will therefore be more successful because the business model is already proven. Right. It's validated. There yeah. are examples. Exactly. But then it comes down to the why, perhaps. It comes down to the why. Why are you pursuing this, or why are you so passionate about what you're doing? I mean, it's a huge part of it, and I think it comes down to, yeah, it comes down to that founder and his personality or her personality. Which one? And that could be different for, you know, if there's 10 investors and 10 founders, they could all get funded, but not necessarily by the one they speed date with. It could be the person at the end of the table likes the person at that end of the right. table, you know? And that will just be a personality thing at the end of the day, who you actually bond with. Absolutely. So, I mean, every founder, like, I mean, when they... When is that point where they should consider fundraising for someone who's bootstrapped and launch the product? I mean, is there a certain time where you would basically recommend, hey, okay, this is where hmm. I need to get an investor? Is there any right answer to that? Is it, if do they require the funds to scale, to actually perform, you know, business objectives? What is that? I mean, is it just purely marketing? Um, I'm going to shoot myself in the foot here <laughs> because my business is doing it. But I, I, would, I would say that <clears throat> as a founder, if you can bootstrap, bootstrap, bootstrap every single day. 
and, and try and get to a point in time where the money that you want to raise is not because you need to raise it, it's just because you want to scale and grow. Scale and Faster grow. than you can do it organically. Absolutely. That's 100% what agree. every founder should do. The story is not quite like that, is it? It's kind of like, here's loads of money and go and grow and scale and do all of those things and build loads of tech and get out there. Uh, and that's kind of what we've grown up into. And, uh, and absolutely, you know, there are, and, and let's say we, you know, what we really want to do is open this up on a, on a global basis to absolutely everyone. I want, personally, I'd like every single founder that's living a problem um, to be able to solve that problem. And if that person happens to have no money, didn't go to a great school, um, he's going to, you know, he's not going to have the immediate network around him, a family right. that can help fund that as well. So there has to be other avenues. So when we talk about, you know, as the, the, the question you just posed, when, when is the right point? But it's also who, who you are as a founder, right? I mean, I'd say the, the right point, just go and get money from your mum and dad and, and start your product. But maybe they don't have it. So that would be the right point for you to go and, you know, find angel investors, go to an incubator, try and speak to some mentors, try and find out how you're going to raise it because you have identified a, a problem that needs to be solved. Absolutely. But you just, just don't have the money to be able to do it and everything costs money, unfortunately. So it is different for each, each and every founder. Mm -hmm. And if we want to kind of um, um, make that playing field more even, then... Everybody needs that opportunity as well. And it's amazing because over the, over the last six months, I've been speaking to a lot of incubators, a lot of um, accelerators, and a lot of startups out of Africa. And it's nuts. It's absolutely nuts. What, what they, they, I don't know why it is, but they have to just have such a much higher level right. than anything I've seen. I've sat down on, on demo days, and you know they've gone. We've got, we've launched our beta, and we've got twenty five thousand users. I'm like, what? <laughs> Are they paying? Yep. So I mean, the it's price really point is different. That's all it price is. Price point, emerging yeah. markets. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay, identifying a problem. I mean, I mean, obviously the solution that works in the U.S. is not particularly going to work in Africa. So they have to, in a way, come up with that. Yeah. You mentioned coming, uh, talking to a lot of the incubators, accelerators, VCs, and founders. I deal with founders on a daily basis, which is which is pretty much why I don't live a boring life. I mean, yeah. every day, you know, we have new ideas coming in, new challenges, um, something, you know, um, obviously, and it's all about passion and their why. Exploring that's always a great conversation. Have you, like, identified, like, <laughs> on a casual note, I mean, there must be so many different kinds of people and personalities. What kind of founder really, you know, intrigues you as a platform or investors in general? Like, I know it's, I'm not trying to stereotype a founder, yeah. but I mean, there's many different kinds, right? What kind would you say personality wise is, has, have you seen being more successful at raising funds? What, is, what are those attributes? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I, I come across so many. I come across the, the, the sort of pure storytellers. Okay, storytellers. Uh, yeah, the real storytellers. I'm mean, full of confidence. Uh, if they weren't a stand-up founder, the chances are they'd be on stage somewhere. Okay. Um, um, and and I think that's a difficult one. We're, we're always told we've got to be a great storyteller so we can stand up and dinner. I think that's a double-edged sword sometimes because if you're such a good storyteller... Everyone does a lot more back work on you right. to make sure that you're not just not blagging it, mm -hmm. um, and you're just very good at storytelling, right? And there's <laughs> nothing behind. Open the door and it's empty. Um, so I think that's a double-edged sword. But it's obviously there's a there has to be a certain level of confidence, a certain level of of storytelling. Um, my my favourites are, are definitely people that have lived the problem. Okay. Um, they're the ones I can relate to the most. They're the ones that you can, um, you talk about the solution, but the solution is just so verifiable by the problem that right. they've, and it's really great to, to brainstorm out the solution they're bringing. They see some very clear steps um, because they've lived it every single, every single day of their life. Um, 
I like you mentioned, the domain experts. Yeah, and I, I, I really do. I feel, I, I feel those guys or, or, or those founders a lot more. Um, but I've come across some really interesting, interesting ones. I've come across some really black ones as well, you know. They've got really dark stories. Um, they failed a lot of times. Right. Um, and they're actually, you know, quite dour characters and quite difficult to... Um, but they, they are determined beyond determined. I mean, I have ultimate trust in, the, in those characters um, because they, they, they are quite dark and they, they are determined. Yeah, because, I mean, most of the investors, they're investing on the founder and how that's also a way that we work with people mm. to see if they're a good fit. I mean, you know, like you mentioned, they want to just probably replicate a success story and say, hey, we want to build this e-commerce platform, a multi-vendor yeah. e-commerce platform. But okay, so let's sit down for a bit. How are you going to take this to market? Like, tell us about yourself. We want to see if we're going to be working with you for like six to eight months yeah. building your venture. Then what is the out- outcome? Is it just, you know, because they've had success? Like, it really comes down to them themselves. Uh, That's what they invest in the team, perhaps an interim CTO. I mean, I be, yeah. I mean, the team, the, the team is part of that makeup, right? right? I mean, you really want to. You'd never want to invest in a team of 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 three that all want to do the exact same thing. You okay. know, that's just going to end up in complete chaos. You're going to get, you know either a lot of marketing done, mm-hmm. a lot of product built, but if they're all doing the same. So you really want to f- see that dynamic and how they work together. But they, the, I think the more, more important thing about you know, that, that sort of fit of the team is that they can identify what they're crap at. Okay. That's what I'm always yeah. looking for. Identifying what you're not good at, yeah. which is what you need to work on. Yeah, and that's really... That's great advice. That's perfect. Yeah, but it's kind of, kind of where I see the sort of investor founder fit. Because if you're an investor and you're really good at X, Y, Z, and that's where you can fill the gap and help, that's, that's fantastic, right? Now you have a perfect triangle. But if you're an investor and I'm really great at building tech and we've got loads of tech people, but you're talking to two engineers who are rubbish at marketing and sales, that's a really bad fit. Absolutely. And I think that's where, you know, as we spoke about before, you know, maybe this fits with that investor. They're all doing the same thing, but you don't know what the fit is until you identify what that conversation is, is going like, how, how, how that's coming together. So it gets very personal at that early stage. It really is about relationships. We can qualify at the level I do fintech because I'm an investor with an expertise in fintech. Right. We can identify, we can qualify, and we can get 10 founders that do fintech. That's where we need to start conversations. That's where we need to start them. And that's currently what doesn't happen. We, we can have like, go on a pitch day and you'll have a fintech investor sitting next to an edtech investor sitting next to a generalist. And then you'll have 20 different guys pitching uh, and they, would do, they do all sorts of stuff. And I want to be doing space tech. There's not a chance in hell that any of these investors understand it or are going to invest in space tech. Exactly. No, not being then horrible it's not to the them. Right place then, I mean. Exactly. It's just a, it's just a, just a mess. It's just like th- throwing random shit at a fan and hoping some of it sticks. So with tech, I mean, on a final note, I mean, I want to probably touch, uh, you know, a base on what's next for the market in terms of the GCC. Do you think it's becoming oversaturated now with the mobile applications or what's next for the market? Like, what's the next thing? I, th- I, <clears throat> I think we've gone through a, a, a great period. Um, and, and that is that we're, we're level um, in this area in terms of technology okay. with every other nation, essentially. You know, we, we always look to Europe and we look to the US. What have they got? What are they doing? How are they using it? We, we've got everything that they use. What we've got now is, is what I feel is a government that has quite rightly... Um, um, built a great plan they started building a plan and they've built it especially here in dubai they've realized that there has to be a a move forward into not just relying on on energy um i think the what they identified incredibly well through the covid period was 
um, digital means you're a nomad. So how do we make it as attractive as possible to be here so that we can get every single technology guy, girl, to be here? And they've made that identification. Hey, and and, and no one else has. I've noticed like a lot of people just coming in after you know they opened the skies. Yeah. I mean, tremendous. I believe that's what it's working on. Like a lot of people who are have been digital nomads in different parts of the world are now flocking, tr- flocking here and trying to set up base. That's yeah. a, something that. All right. Good. Um, metaverse. Uh, have you been exploring any particular uh, I can in, in investors that have shown interest? Startups abs- in the metaverse, AR, VR space. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when when this started happening, I was kind of scratching my head and thinking, what the hell is this? I mean, it's so dystopian, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, right. we'll go and live behind our goggles and let's ignore what's going on in the real world. And uh, it's kind of, I couldn't find a use case for it. Um yeah, um, use case. I mean, I believe training or uh, education has been a yeah. huge um, aspect where, you know, it could be a- applied. Yeah. That's one thing. But the metaverse is like completely changing things. That yeah, I started. So then I started seeing some use cases coming through and it got me kind of excited and I can understand what's going on and why it would be better. I, I think the limitation right now to it taking off is I don't think there's a whole bunch of us want to sit there with a huge pair of goggles on and actually dislocate 100% from the real world. Of course. I think we'd like the experience. Yeah. But in an, maybe the middle step is just an augmented reality experience where I can, like, you know, you've got JP Morgan, Metaverse Bank. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe if I could sort of have that experience augmented in my glasses and I could go and do my banking while still having a conversation with you. And, and have the two experiences rather than having to be locked into locked something. In. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's I've about s- maybe having the option to to be able to do that. Yeah. It would be nice to have that, but not completely just separate. Yeah, it's, it's just a bit too separate. Mm-hmm. Um, I, no, I'm not 100%. You know, I've, I've, I've looked at it it's sort of like this whole NFT craze, um, you know, J, JPEGs, but... At the end of the day, an NFT is quite simply, it's just a contract. It's just a digit. We had them before. They were just renamed NFTs. And we started talking about J- JPEGs. And now the whole population uh, of the world just r- relates to an NFT being a bit of digital art. Well, it's not. It's, it's a contract that gives you the ownership of anything. It's not about the art at the end of the day. Yeah, it's not. Uh, and I think but it confused a lot of the market. And I think we just explored another topic for next time. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I think that'd be great, you know, with your experience from the financial markets. And we've seen the rise in crypto, NFTs, smart contracts. I would love to be able to talk specifically about that. Yeah. Um, and hey, I think it's been great, a lovely conversation, a lot of insights for our audience and myself. We have to learn every day. This is why we're holding the podcast, uh, this series. Um, So on an ending note, is there certain advice that you'd like to give to the audience, the entrepreneurs, even um, I I would say it's not just the entrepreneurs, the founders. We've been working with MNCs and small, medium sized enterprises as well. Uh, Innovation wise, uh, what would you like to just give out an advice to the audience on an ending note? Yeah, I I really think it would be. As an early stage investor, there's a lot of new new investors come to the market. I think you know really understand what power law is, understand how many how many companies do fail, um, and really understand what you're investing in. Stick to your domain expertise as well, where maybe as an angel you can add some value to those founders. Um, I think that's really important. It's a super tough game to to make money out of early stage. Early stage, it's yeah. really tough. Um, and on uh, on the other side, um, well, actually back on that, um, don't necessarily always invest. We're, we're thinking you've got to have a home run. I've got to have the next Uber. Right. You know, you, there can be a lot of businesses that give you venture type returns um, that don't have to be the next Uber. You just have to get stable businesses. And on the other side, I think that's what we need to do with founders and business owners 
is say you don't have to just grow at any cost. You have to build a business, a real business, that you know where you buy something, you do something with it, and you sell it for more than you bought it for, um, and you make money. That's what a business is, and I think we have to think about that a little, a little bit more as well, and start building some real traction with some real customers. Uh, it's interesting how does. you know there's a uh, repeat cycle, like you know, similar to how they have in fashion, where something goes mm. out of style, then comes back in style, goes out of style, comes back in style. So, yeah. I think with the traditional business models are now back again, where we have to focus a lot more on business, on actually making revenue, uh, profit. I, I think so. Great. These are these have been great takeaways. Um, you know, I am excited. I obviously love the conversation thank you i've identified a few other things to talk about which we will soon enough if you would be able to take out the time With pleasure. thank you guys uh thank you for watching uh we will definitely be back and post this up with the key takeaways it's been really uh, it's been an honor to have you hey, thank you so, so much, much for your time